Eric here. So who am I? Uh, my name is Eric. Uh, I'm in my 30s. I live in Minnesota. Uh, recently my wife and I bought some land and we're planning on building a house on it. Um, so I'm, why am I doing this? I like building stuff. I like designing stuff. It's what I do. And we want a very energy efficient house and want a layout that we may not be able to just purchase anywhere. So what's going to be in the video? I'm going to talk about why you would want to build a post frame house. What is the layout? How will it be built? Uh, and then what are some of the systems going into the house, like the ground source geothermal, and then how much will it cost? So let's jump right in. So why post frame? Uh, a lot of people might ask, why not build a different style house? Well, it has low part count, a lot of simple foundation, low maintenance, easy to insulate, and a lot of standardization. So low part count. You can see here there's a lot, not a lot of parts to the house in the framing. Uh, simple foundation, you can see that there's not a lot to the foundation. It doesn't use as much concrete as a standard house. Low maintenance, this is my grandpa's Lester barn. It's been there about 40 years. He doesn't really maintain it a lot from what I know, and it looks like it's in great shape still. Uh, easy to insulate, a lot of space there to insulate the structure in the base. Easy to make a well-insulated house. Standardization. That means there's a lot of places you can buy it from. If there's a lot of places to buy it's competition and that's a good thing for your budget. So where are we planning on building? Uh, this is in McLeod County which is in south central Minnesota. There's five acres. It's zoned residential already but does not have any hookups for electric, septic, water, any of that. Uh, here's a top-down view of the house in the planned garage. And then we're going to zoom in a little closer, enhance, enhance. You can see here, looking at the layout of the house, there's a subtle change to the grade of the house. So that's why it's got that retaining wall around the outside. Grade drops a few feet over the course of the house. Uh, one concept I'm utilizing here is the passive house concept of having a lot of self-facing windows to try to capture some of that solar energy. Uh, jumping into the layout, this is the layout of the house, a non-traditional layout for accomplishing a four bedroom, two bath house in a 40 by 40 square. It's a square uh, that is the most energy efficient layout because you get the least amount of exterior wall space. Uh, I like having the big open area for the living room, dining room, and the kitchen. It's got a media room for watching movies on the projector and then bedrooms all around the outside. Utility room uh, is right in the middle so it doesn't suck up any of that valuable wall space. And then here are some of the sizes. The sizes are a little on the small side for the bedrooms but I'm aware of that and I like it. So uh, Here's an image of the living room, image of the kitchen, image of the mechanical room which I will go into later, um, and the image of the media room. And then here we're jumping into the build process. So the first thing to be built will be the geothermal lines in the ground. These are going to be dug down 10 to 12 feet deep with a mini excavator. There will be three separate loops of 1,000 feet of pipe, so a 500 foot run each. And I've got those extending out over the 5 acres to cover a lot of square area. I'm not doing the slinky type loop um, system just because I've got the space to play with and I don't mind the, the time it will take to dig longer. Here's the build sequence, so we're jumping in, we just dug the geothermal loops, you can see those coming in on the right. I'm going to have the well line put in, I'm going to have the electric come in at this point in time. I'm going to remove one to two feet of topsoil, and then I'm going to throw a geotextile, a non-permeable fabric on top of it. I'm going to get into why later. Uh, next on the build sequence is putting the columns in. So these will be the perma columns, and they're going to have a concrete pier surrounding them. And I'm going to temporarily put the grade board in, which is that horizontal board that connects the columns. Uh, next up is the drain waste vent system. So this will be the drain portion of the system feeding the septic. Uh, it's all going to fall into that septic. And I'm going to go into the layout of this more later, but this is just showing it dropping in. And at this stage, we're going to start filling that bowl, so to speak, up with three-quarter inch washed rock. And so now we're going to keep building up higher and higher and higher. We're going to build each stage is going to be one level of that retaining wall. So we're putting the horizontal insulation in for the slab itself. I'm going to get into the design of that later, but it's going in. Now we're putting the vertical insulation in, and there's a PVC protective sheet that goes around the insulation so the foam itself is not exposed to the exterior wall. So we're going to keep adding up more and more of that rock fill, keep adding the retaining wall. So here we got the radon mitigation system that's coming in. Uh, that's to suck the radon out of the soil and blow it out. I'm going to, again, show more details later. 
and we're finishing up by putting more and more height to the retaining wall. And finally we fill it all the way to the brim and this is the stage where we're ready to start throwing the building itself on there. So the next up is the columns. The columns will be bolted to the perma columns and then on top of that will be the trusses, the purlins, the joints, and the bracing. So the way this is planned to do is using some um, winches on top of the columns. We're going to build up complete bays on the ground and then winch the whole bay up into the air and set it on the trusses. So that avoids using a heavy, big, expensive crane to do that stage. It can be done slower and on the ground. Uh, then we're going to put the condensate barrier and the roof steel on the top of the structure. Uh, and then at this stage we're going to prep for concrete. You put the vapor barrier down and then the foam that goes under the slab, planting four inches of foam there. Uh, now the concrete guys will come in, do the concrete. I'm going to sub that out because I'm not a concrete expert. Uh, and then we're on to the framing. Uh, in the post frame world, uh, the exterior framing is called girts. That's the horizontal members you see there. And then there's window framing that comes around as well. And then the next step is the weather resistant barrier, the window flashing, the windows themselves, the window trim and the doors. And then lastly, the steel and the trim. So with this style of building, it's different than a standard building. The siding or the steel actually contributes a lot to the strength of the structure, much as the outside of an airplane uh, in a monocoque contributes to its strength. So that's a very important detail there. So now I've stripped away the roof, and I'm going to show some of the details that go into the attic. So we're going to put the weather resistant barrier, sorry, the vapor barrier in and do the ceiling steel, which is very much like the exterior steel. And now we're going to do the interior walls. These will be standard stud walls on two foot cinders and there'll be a double wall for the utility room. That's to keep the sound transmission low from all the utilities that are inside of there. Uh, another unique detail is the floating connection on the top. It's got a two inch gap and it floats on 60D nails. That's because the trusses themselves are going to move up and down um, as they dry out during the winter. Um, next on the build sequence is the electric runs to the sub panels that are in the utility room. Uh, those may go under the slab or I may put them in the attic, still deciding. Uh, next up, you can see I got another view of those. Uh, now we're doing the, the vent lines for the drain waste vent system. More details on that to come later in the presentation. Here's another shot of those from the top. And then uh, the heat recovery ventilation system goes in. It's going to pull from one side of the house and exhaust on the other. And in red is the radon mitigation fan as well, which is coming out through the slab. Now we are under the house. We are looking up into the house, and this is the PEX line. So those will be the first thing to be hung from the steel ceiling. Um, so those will feed both to the bathrooms and to the kitchen area. Next up is the electrical conduit. This is one inch PVC conduit. This is going to feed all only to the exterior of the house. And that's again because that movement of the trusses, we don't want to connect directly to anything that's going to have that subtle movement. Now here, this is the HVAC duct work. So all the heat loss of the house is going to be for the windows. That's the worst case of the heat loss. So I'm putting in one vent per window uh, to equalize that out. You can see it's all running from that central um, distribution area in the utility room. 8 inch spiral duct everywhere hanging from the ceiling. Um, and they've got, lastly we've got the HRV that's going to pull air, um, older air from the, the bathrooms and then it's going to put it through the HRV system and dump it into the return of the, the HVAC. At this stage it's time to come insulate the house. What's shown here are 2 by 8 walls. I may change that to something else, more details later. Um, so this will have rock wool insulation in the walls, rock wool insulation in the interior walls, uh, foam under the slab and around the slab, and then fiberglass blown insulation to R60 above the, uh, the ceiling. So when we get to this stage, we're going to dry the whole structure out, get all the moisture out of the framework so it's ready for the drywall. Uh, here comes the drywall, got drywall going on the walls, no drywall on the ceilings because it's going to be an acoustical drop ceiling, which is shown here. So that's the acoustical drop ceiling, got a little gap around the outside of that just because I like the look and it will make it easier to work on it. So now I'm going to jump into showing some of the more detailed systems of the house and how the house is sited. So this is a topographical map of the acreage. And you can see we're going to place the house on the western part of this high and dry. 
soil suitability. So I'm looking at a web soil survey result here. This is from web soil survey utility, which you can go to here, showing the suitability for buildings without basements. So it's good where I've sited the house, not so good everywhere else. Now we're looking at the soil type. This is type ML or medium loam. It's a little on the softer side as far as soils go. Uh, soil plasticity. Uh, again, you want to keep this number below 15% ideally. So we're right there at the limit. So it means it's a good, good time to be careful. Water table depth. It's a fairly high water table. Another point of caution. Uh, clay loading. A substantial amount of clay in the soil. More, more caution suited there. So now I'm jumping into the calculations for the geothermal. So why is, how is the geothermal system going to work? Uh, and what are the temps in the soil? So I've looked at some uh, nearby soil temp data. This is from a, a farm, research farm that is just north of where the build site is planned. And I've got historical temps for the soil going back 22 years. And I've taken those temps and I've constructed an amplitude. So how, how much does the temp go up and down each year? And then what is the worst case for that over all those years? For That would cover like a 99.7% of the case. Cases that might be possible. So I'm taking that and I'm feeding that into a soil temp model. This is a very simple model. It just takes a sine sweep and it's shifting that by a delay factor and it's reducing that amplitude by another soil factor. So these are all the numbers that feed into that, feeding off the type of soil, uh, the temps, etc. I'm showing it for 10 feet. The important part here is that at the worst part of the winter, um, the coldest temp that the soil will get is about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So moving into the calculations here, you can see on this table for the operation of the geothermal condenser that it can still work happily at water temps in the neighborhood of 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So more details on that to come. Uh, I've done some preliminary uh, manual J calcs with a quick tool and it's shown a heating load of 28 kBTU. And you can see here that the free ton um, condenser is capable of supporting that load. Uh, so I've got the air handler, it's going to hang from some uh, separate pieces of wood here in the utility room. It's going to be isolated and have a drip tray under it. Uh, it'll have some flex joints. Um, so here's some more views of all the return and the various systems for the HVAC. You can see here um, it's feeding into the spiral ducts from this big plenum on top. And then the returns are for two separate returns with two separate filter boxes that mainly will suck through the hallway. But they also have these additional vents that will pull from the bedrooms. And these are, um, the, the idea here is to have the minimal restriction possible to get the most flow possible. Um, the, the reason for that is the geothermal systems, when they heat, they're not going to heat to the same temperature that you'd get with burning stuff. So it's going to heat to a lower temp, so you need more flow to accomplish the same heat transmission for the system. So that's a negative for the design of the system, but it's a plus for you when you're living there because uh, it's going to dry out your house a little less during the winter. It's going to be a little more comfortable. Uh, here we are looking at the drain waste vent system from underneath the house again. Um, got wet vents for both bathrooms. They're on a separate wet vent, so in case you clog one bathroom, it will not clog the other one. I'm trying to run as much as possible of the plumbing outside of the boundary of the slab in case you have to get to it later. And I'm not showing the slope in here. It was too complicated to model the slopes or everything, but we'll have the standard slope for the, the DWB. Here we are, more details on the design of the foundation. This is going to use what's called a frost-protected shallow foundation typically used for a standard style foundation, not the post frame style, just slab. But the concept has been adapted to the post frame type foundation or slab by Hanson Pole Buildings. Here you can see their design notes. So I'm doing something pretty similar. And again, I'm going to put a low permeability geotextile underneath the sub base. The idea there is to keep any water out of the soil underneath the slab. You don't want to get those changes in water content during the winter and the seasons that make that pumping action that will break the slab. So here we are. This is looking at the section view of the whole house. So you can see here you got the details such as here is the under slab insulation, the vertical insulation, which actually have two separate panels. The outer one is inch and a half so it can butt up nicely against the grade board and have a nice flush surface there. And then lastly, the horizontal wing insulation has a slope to it. So the wall framing itself is 2x8, shown in this CAD model. 
I'm considering changing the wall girts from 2x8 down to 2x6 and then adding an additional stud wall. So what that will get me is a Mooney wall. Mooney wall is another name for a crosshatch style wall. Why would you want that? Well, your biggest heat losses in a wall system like this with studs or girts are going to be the members themselves, the structural members. They're going to bridge uh, the heat and let the heat pass right through them. So if the Mooney style wall, it has less of those um, short circuits and there's less places where there is wood passing completely through the wall. Um, so you avoid some of the fernal bridging that's present. And you almost get that completely for free with the post frame style house because you can have an inner stud wall as opposed to the horizontal little strips you would have in a standard Mooney wall. Uh, windows, I'm just doing standard vinyl windows. I am doing triple pane to get the extra uh, insulation value out of them. Electric, um, let's see, 400 amp total service, Siemens solar ready outer panel with a meter main, and then it's going to feed the two sub panels that are in the utility room. Uh, load calcs, a lot of calculations here, but it justified the 400 amp service. Water treatment, not expecting great water quality at this area, so I've got a lot of different devices here to fix that. Uh, iron filter, water softener, and then a whole house water filter. The point of the whole house water filter will be to extend the life of the under sink reverse osmosis filter. Uh, the radon system, so why does it need a radon mitigation system? Well, if you look at this map, you can see Minnesota is like right in the middle of some of the worst areas for radon exposure. So we've got the under slab radon mitigation system, nice beefy six inch fan that's going to pull all that air under the slab. It's got little trace elements of radon in it, pull up and away so it doesn't seep through the slab and get to you in the house. And then lastly, the cost. How much will it cost? Uh, I estimated the total to be around 200k. And then if you add in some factors for just guessing at all the things I've missed, I'm thinking around 225. Um, so that's a lot of money. Uh, it's more than I would have hoped. Uh, prices just have gone up lately, so nothing you can do there. Uh, in conclusion, that's the design I've got for the house so far. Uh, I'm pretty proud of it so far, but I'd like any tips as possible to make it either cheaper, uh, higher performing, or easier to build. Uh, thanks for watching. Eric signing out.